Welcome to the Healing Pain Podcast with Dr. Joe Tata. Each week, we interview top experts in physical therapy, pain science, and integrative pain care. You'll learn the most up-to-date information for treating and reversing persistent pain. This podcast is for educational purposes only and not intended to be used as personalized medical advice. And now, here's your host, Dr. Joe Tata. Hey there, friends. Welcome to this week's episode of the Healing Pain Podcast. Today, we're discussing both the research and clinical applications of the use of a ketogenic diet to treat neurodegeneration, autoimmunity, and cancer. This week, we're joined by not one, but two guests I know you're going to love and learn lots of great information from. Our first guest is Dr. Matthew Phillips. He's a neurologist who is both studying and using a ketogenic diet. And our second guest is his patient, Serona Ramika, who is a stage four cancer survivor. Dr. Phillips is a full-time clinical and research neurologist in New Zealand. His passion is to explore the potential feasibility, safety, and efficacy of metabolic therapies, particularly ketogenic diets and fasting, in creating alternate metabolic states that may improve not only symptoms, but also function and quality of life for people with a variety of neurological conditions. Serona is the first documented person in the world to utilize a fasting and ketogenic diet as the primary management strategy for a metastatic cancer in the absence of surgery, chemotherapy, or radiotherapy, culminating in a near-complete regression. Nearly three years after being diagnosed with inoperable metastatic cancer, she shows no signs of disease and leads a full and active life. Okay, without further ado, let's meet Dr. Matthew Phillips and his patient, Serona, and learn all about the implications for a ketogenic diet. Dr. Phillips and Serona, welcome to the Healing Pain Podcast. It's great to have both of you here today. Thank you. It's nice thanks, to be here. Dr. Phillips, thanks for accepting uh, my offer to be on the podcast. I know we have a lot to talk about with regard to how a ketogenic diet can have an impact on health and some chronic diseases. And I especially want to thank you for inviting Serona on the podcast to kind of give the patient perspective, which I think is really important, especially in today's uh, era of personalized medicine. So Serona, thanks for being here. And I, I would love to start with you before we get into some of the science with Dr. Phillips. Um, tell us a little bit about your story, like how you first heard about the ketogenic diet and your experience with being on a ketogenic diet. Okay. Well, Matt, Matt was originally my neurologist. So I had an um, autoimmune system uh, condition, myasthenia gravis, and I was seeing Matt for that. So um, I was 37 and I was pregnant with my first baby. And I, I was one week away from giving birth and I was having difficulty breathing throughout the whole pregnancy. And we just, every time I'd go into a and &E, the doctors would put it down to um, the baby pushing on my diaphragm. But one week out, I, I couldn't breathe. I was in so much pain. And when they took me into hospital, they did an x-ray and found out that I had um, tumours in my heart, lung, and, um, yeah, just on my chest. They, they measured 19 centimetres. And so I, I gave birth to Pep and... Then I was meeting with oncologists and right in the middle of those meetings, I'd already planned a meeting with Matt for the myasthenia gravis. So he just happened to be in the middle of this crazy chaos that was going on. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I went to see him and to be honest at the time, I, I didn't see the point. We almost cancelled because we thought, well, you know, I don't really need to worry about the disease when I'm fighting cancer. Um, but it was just a blessing in disguise because we got in there and we told Matt what had happened and straight away he said, well, what are you doing about it? And um, I had been given the option of palliative chemo. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't something that I was yeah, heading towards. We were looking for alternative therapies. And I, was, um, I had researched about an uh, alkaline diet online. So I told him I was trying to follow an alkaline diet, but... I really had no idea because there's so much conflicting, um, conflicting lists. And then that's when Matt started talking to me about keto and fasting. Um, my husband had already dabbled in keto a few years, a few years prior, and he had always talked to me about how great he felt. And um, I just ignore him because I love sugar and I love processed food, and I I couldn't understand the whole concept of eating fat, yeah, for health. Um, so he had done it and he, he really was keen for it. 
but um, yeah, I struggled a wee bit just getting my head around it. But once we talked to Matt, Matt just led me through everything. And for the next two and a half years, well, even now, that's that was my life, keto and fasting. So we um, we use that as the sole therapy for fighting cancer. Um, I came off my medication for the myasthenia gravis, and we managed that through um, IVIG, um, because prior to that I was on azathioprine, so that would suppress the immune system, but then now we needed the immune system to fight the cancer. So it was a real balancing act um, while, I was, while I was fighting the cancer, because the first time I fasted, I just, um, yeah, I, my body had such a meltdown with, I think, years of toxins and medication that I just, um, couldn't walk from the myasthenia gravis, so we just had to balance that the whole time. Um, yeah, but I mean, that's, that's a good start. That's, that's what I did um, just to fight the cancer. And for two, two years, two and a half years, that was, um, that was, I guess, the struggle was maintaining that and um, yeah, trying not to go off of course, um, and then a year ago, I ended up in hospital with a, a really bad relapse with the myasthenia gravis. I was on a um, ventilator for three weeks, um, but then when I came out, we discovered that the tumor had shrunk by ninety six percent. So that's amazing. Amazing. And then give us an idea of just, um, so of course, uh, cancer is a, a big thing. And obviously that uh, it helped resolve that. Give us an idea of what other symptoms you noticed resolving as you started to adopt this ketogenic style of eating. Right. Well, it was, it was a crazy time because we knew, that, we knew that when I was doing the keto and the fasting, my immune system was on super boost. We knew that because the myasthenia would present so rapidly and, and um, so we knew that it was working right um, and I really struggled with my family and my friends seeing that this was a good thing because all they could see was I was so sick from the myasthenia um, but over time every time I fasted the myasthenia would get less um, and it would almost like it was coming under control and this is only with IVIG um, and now I just might add, I haven't had anything for a year. So I'm on prednisone at the moment, but it's a very low dose. I've never been able to do this before. So I, I just attribute this to the ketogenic diet. Um, but all of those pills that I was taking for the myasthenia for so long, um, yeah, they were just suppressing the immune system. When I'm on keto, a lot of those um, symptoms, they started to, I don't know, normalize. My, my body just started getting a lot healthier. I didn't have the, the lows as much. Um, yeah, things, things are just coming right, I feel. I feel like I'm the healthiest I've ever been. So pain started to resolve, I'm assuming? Pain. Um, I didn't really have pain from my senior gravis. What that did was it, it stopped the muscles from working. Mm -hmm. So it would just be weakness. Um, now I don't, I don't really have that. I don't see symptoms how I used to see them. Yeah. And what about like overall kind of uh, energy level and mood? Did you notice a change in that at all? Yeah, well, that's crazy. So that's amazing because I, I was on a constant um, carb, <laughs> carb high. I would eat every half hour. Um, and the crazy thing is that even though I have the myasthenia, I would have more energy than my parents and, you know, the rest of my family who was on a normal diet. And that was just from the ketogenic diet. Mm -hmm. So I'd just, I'd be like the energizer bunny. I'd go until I crashed, which was normally about nine or 10. Yeah. And then I'd have less sleep. Which is nice to have because oftentimes with myasthenia gravis, there are big complaints of fatigue, which can be, challenging for people to overcome. Yeah, my husband said to me once, if you knew that there was a diet that could help the myasthenia, would you do it? And I said, yeah, of course I would. And he goes, well, why don't you try this? And I said, because it's trying. And there's all these other things that I could try. People talk about 
trying um, paleo and, you know, trying this and that. But because I had to try it for the cancer, <laughs> um, now I reap the benefits yeah. for the myasthenia. <clears throat> and I really think that there will be a time, <clears throat> excuse me, where I'm on no medication at all. Because um, I just find that it's being managed so well. And would you say to other, other people listening to this who are thinking about a ketogenic diet or maybe have, you know, tried it, but haven't kind of fully gone all in, so to speak, what would your advice be to them? First of all, I guess, would you say it's difficult for someone to maintain a ketogenic diet or to start a ketogenic diet? Um, I think it's difficult to start. I wouldn't say it's difficult to maintain once you understand it. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd say I'm the poster child for someone who doesn't want to do it. So my my core diet would be like I'd have four four chocolate bars a day. I love chocolate. I still love chocolate and ice cream and anything that's easy. Um, but once you understand it and get your head around it, then yeah, a lot of those assumptions go away. And um, you know, it's like we like the ease of picking up things from the dairy. Mm -hmm. um, but now I, I reap the benefits and I see the difference that my life has with quality of life. Um, so I'm never going to go back to a normal, to a normal diet. Um, and I don't want my kids to either. So I mean, they're not keto yet, but I hope that one day they would be just by eating, you know, or just, just being empowered by the knowledge of, of what ketogenic food or eating does. Um, yeah, but I think it's more about the understanding of foods and getting your head around the carbs and what they're doing more than anything. And once people get that and have that understanding, it's not difficult. It's not like a diet. It's just a way of eating. Well, I'm glad you're talking to your, your family about different diet changes. That's so important because so many times these, you know, motivational factors and diet really kind of start in our home. So that's, that's huge. And of course, everyone's going to hear your story today. So you're going to be talking to your practitioners as well as other people who have conditions similar to your own. Have you thought about reaching out to other, you know, people with myasthenia gravis and cancer? Have you done a lot of outreach to other, other patients? Yeah. So um, where I live in Topol, there's quite a big community here. Um, there's a lot, a lot in the community who do keto. And in part, we have this great doctor here, um, a GP, Glenn Davies, and he started a reverse type 2 diabetes group. So I think there's, there might be over 100 patients at the moment who have reversed type 2 diabetes. Mm. Um, so everyone here is really open to the diet for health benefits um, rather than weight loss. And I do have a website, um, bewellfast.com. And so that's just sharing my journey um, both on the spiritual and emotional side, as well as some of the practical steps that, that we did. Um, you know, when it comes to change, though, it starts, it starts with the medical practitioners. And when I was first being admitted into Matt's hospital, um, no one was really on board and dietitians were coming to see me thinking that I had an eating disorder. Uh -huh. And we would explain to them, I didn't, I didn't have an eating disorder. And I'd, I'd have a list of all the food, but, you know, they hear keto or diet. And they just, and I was underweight too, right? So the myasthenia had affected my bowels and I couldn't keep anything in, so I lost 10 kgs. So when I go in there underweight, yeah, they just, they wouldn't really look at the cause. They just thought it was my food. But this last time I went in, like Matt has made such a huge change in this massive hospital. Hospital They had a keto dietitian. Um, you know, it's just incredible the forward thinking that's happening in the hospital. So, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely talking to people and, you know, sharing Matt's stuff. And, yeah, we're really fortunate to live in a place where people are open-minded and but I mean, you know, it comes from hard work from people like Matt and people like Glenn who have actually just kept on pressing into colleagues and patients and are relentless. Well, I thank you for being here and getting us off on the right foot today and sharing your story. I know a lot of people are going to really benefit from it and you'll have this forever now to share with other people who are interested. So I appreciate your being here. Dr. Thank Phillips, you. let's talk about, you know, some of the science behind the ketogenic diet and just you know, we can, of course, relate it to Serona's story. 
Um, but I know earlier on you did some research uh, at first, if I believe, on a ketogenic diet and Parkinson's disease. I know it's small, it's a small pilot study, but I think it's still pretty significant. Can you tell us about that study and some of the outcomes? Yeah, thanks, uh, Joe. So that was done three years ago now, and we basically had 47 people with Parkinson's disease, which is a neurodegenerative disorder, as you know. And we, it was a randomized controlled trial, so half the, of the patients went on a modified ketogenic diet that we designed four people with that disorder and the other half went on the low fat diet and sort of the optimal version of the low fat diet that would be you know uh, recommended by the New Zealand food guidelines and we just pitted those two diets against each other for not a long time eight weeks and measured um, the Parkinson's disease through various um, indices we used a very good um, measurement or rating scale to do that, a, co a comprehensive one called the MDS-UPDRS, it's just an acronym. But what we found by the end of the eight weeks, uh, and we played out both diets, so we made both diets, you know, uh, promoted the advantages of both diets, and, and we really got people into their respective diet. And at the end of the eight weeks, we found that, uh, I guess the main finding of the study was that um, the people on the ketogenic diet improved uh, in their non-motor symptoms a lot more than people on the low-fat diet. And that was uh, a pretty key finding because the non-motor symptoms are these uh, sort of hidden symptoms of Parkinson's disease that actually affect quality of life a lot more than the motor symptoms, which most people associate with the disorder. So when you think of Parkinson's, you think of the tremor, uh, the shaking, stiffness, walking difficulties, that kind of thing. Those are the apparent things. It's like, uh, but, but in, in actuality, that's the tip of the iceberg. If you view ice Parkinson's as an iceberg, the motor symptoms, just what you see on the top, the bulk of the disorder is the non-motor symptoms. And that includes uh, things like well, pain, <laughs> big time and different kinds of pain associated with Parkinson's. So um, there are five pain types associated with Parkinson's disease. And it includes, uh, the non-motor symptoms include things like um, urinary problems and gut disorders, constipation. So Parkinson's affects the neurons in the gut. Uh, and uh, it, it includes things like blood pressure issues, uh, mood problems, big time depression, anxiety, it, uh, it includes things like apathy, fatigue, uh, sleep. Parkinson's is almost universally associated with sleep dysfunction, such as insomnia. And so uh, the remarkable thing with, with this diet in only eight weeks, the non-motor symptoms collectively improved by 40% compared to baseline. I mean, they, they were cut almost in half. Whereas the low-fat diet, um, they improved by 10%. So, you know, that might have been a bit of placebo effect, which you, you know, you have to uh, remember in, in trials with human patients, a placebo effect is always something to consider. Um, but the 40% uh, reduction in motor symptom severity in the keto group was quite remarkable. The motor symptoms improved in both groups to about the same degree, about 20-25%. And um, I have you know, various theories as to why they, that was uh, the case. Um, but yeah, the, I guess the, the salient finding from that study was that uh, the non-motor symptoms improved and the main five ones that improved were uh, urinary dysfunction, pain, fatigue, daytime sleepiness, and cognition, which interestingly, the medications for Parkinson's, which are pretty good at dealing with the motor symptoms, re they really don't do much for those five. Right. And so that was really cool. It meant maybe the diet could be synergistic with medications. Yeah, I think the cognition part was really interesting in that study as well. So you mentioned the, so obviously you have the, the ketogenic group and then you have the, the low fat diet group, the, which is a, you mentioned because you're in New Zealand. That would be kind of akin to our US MyPlate um, type diet. Is that right? Yeah, it was, we tried to concentrate on, uh, you know, healthy carbohydrates. So it did not have, a lot of processed sugar. There was like a smattering of brown sugar and a couple of the dessert recipes. It was 
it was a lot of starchy root vegetables, normal vegetables as well, and uh, lots of fruits. So the things that you know a low-fat diet proponent would look at and go, yeah, that's a pretty healthy diet. Yeah. And then did you just start to use it then with other groups of patients, or how did that start to develop in your practice? Uh, so after the study, the, the trick is uh, there's only been two randomized trials, well, two trials of a ketogenic diet in people with Parkinson's. There's been a number of them in uh, animal models. So um, the, the only other one was about 15 years ago now, now by um, Dr. Ted Van Italy, who's who passed away uh, in the last couple of years. He, he was quite, quite old. And, and so given that there's only two studies, although it was a randomized control trial, I, uh, you know, if I have a patient that's really interested in doing it, I'll be like, okay, go for it. Here's what you need to do. And uh, I can guide them through it. And I have a few people um, from the trial still doing the ketogenic diet because they experience such a profound relief of their symptoms. Remember, these non-motor symptoms are the, have more effect on quality of life uh, by far than the motor symptoms. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and I have some, the occasional patient who, who comes in from somewhere and says, I want to try it and they do it. That's, that's fine. But I, I don't push it because uh, the evidence base isn't strong yet. You know, it's two studies. What I do tell people with Parkinson's, if they, you know, I tell them universally, uh, if you eat real food, that is probably a no brainer. And if they're really interested, then I can, I, I help guide them to do the ketogenic diet, which when you get down to it, the ketogenic diet, at least the one we use and the one Serona used, and including the big meal her family made for me last night, it's, it's just removing three things. You get rid of your processed sugar, you're getting rid of your grains, and you're getting rid of your fleshy fruit. And none of those things are really natural if you go back 10,000 years. Um, except, you know, berries are okay, wild berries, so we allow that in our keto plans. So, and that's all it is. And then you up the fats. And, um, yeah, it's, it's really not that difficult to think of when you frame it that way. Yeah, so someone might... Um... I guess identify that as a modified ketogenic diet, so to speak. That is what it is. Yeah, yeah. it's not a, uh, it's not one of the classic ketogenic diets or the MCT keto diet. You know those older diets. I, I liken them to you know sort of Model T uh, versions of the ketogenic diet. I mean they are very restrictive and not a pleasure to eat. The, food, the diet is supposed to be enjoyable, and like Serona said, she'll never go back. And you know um, it's that's what we aim for because if you're not enjoying the, the, the lifestyle change, it's a big change. If you're not enjoying it, then it, it won't last. And that's really what we've always been aiming for is to have a, a modified version that's, uh, that's workable with people's lifestyles. That's not one of those classic, you know, those older ketogenic diets. Yeah. And we don't cook just for us. Um, we do family keto meals. Our teenagers just don't know it. But, you know, that's an example of how much they enjoy it. That's good. So obviously when it's modified, it's approachable for everyone. And it's something you can adopt for the long term, which is important because oftentimes people go on diets, crash diets, all sorts of different diets that last a week or two. And then, you know, they're off it. And that's obviously not the goal. Yeah, it's very adaptable. I mean, we just did this uh, in a study with Alzheimer's patients that studies under review still. Um, and, you know, you can do a ketogenic diet that's pure carnivore if you want, or pure vegetarian. And we had people of both ilks in that study. It's very, the, the whole point is it's putting your body into a, key, a state of ketosis and, and it doesn't matter how you do it. So the whole, you know, it's not really, a, it's sometimes seen as a fad diet, but it's not. It's, it's put, it's, I don't even like to frame it as a diet. It's a therapy puts your body into a state and it can be vegetarian uh, carnivore a mix whatever you want to do it doesn't matter it's just about getting your body into the keto state which has so many benefits for you know theoretical benefits for so many diseases so tell us in your words what ketosis is and how it benefits our you know human health for certain types of conditions the ones we're talking about today that's a really good question so I would define ketosis as um, 
people would define it different ways, but I would say, uh, you know, you're in a state of physiological ketosis, meaning um, nutritional ketosis, whatever you want to call it, when you have a ketone level of 0.6 or higher in your blood, and that's measuring the main blood ketone, which is beta hydroxybutyrate or BHP. And when, when that's, you know, above point, 0.6 or above, ideally, it depending, depends on what you're using it for, what your purposes are, but maybe ideally one, two, or three uh, millimole per liter, then you're in a state of ketosis. And people, unless you sort of have type 1 diabetes and stop taking your insulin, you're not really going to get it above eight millimoles per liter. You know, I can fast for two weeks and it, it won't go <laughs> any higher. And it won't do that in, in anyone without a serious metabolic disorder like type 1 diabetes. So um, that's what it is. And now in terms of the benefits, a lot of people focus on the ketones themselves, which are little energy molecules that the liver makes from fat. So when you, when you fast, uh, your body goes into, you know, using its stored fat reserves for energy. Now, this is for your viewers that don't know much about it because I'm sure you do. And when you have a ketogenic diet, <clears throat> you're still using fat for energy, but it's in the food you eat. So that's the main difference. The ketogenic diet is kind of like, I liken it to the, uh, and put your body, it's, it's like the mimic of fasting. It's like a slightly weaker version of fasting, but of course it's sustainable because you're taking food in. And anyways, when you do that, either way, you make these ketones, your liver makes these ketones, and the ketones can produce more energy per unit of oxygen consumed compared to a glucose molecule. Most of the time, your muscles and brain tissue and most, most of your body tissues are using glucose all the time. But when, you know, like in Serona's case, she's gone on the ketogenic diet, uh, now you've got these ketones running around and there's not much, as much glucose. So a lot of cells, such as neurons, start becoming hybrid engines. They use ketones and glucose. The ketones produce more energy, use less oxygen. They produce fewer free radicals. And they're just um, better in an energy sense for your cells. And that's really important in neurological disorders because neurons require you know, probably more energy than any other cell in the body. And if you... And that's the ketone. The ketones also have other roles. They have uh, signaling roles. That, so um, they actually can uh, stimulate, for example, the elevation, the upregulation of uh, important um, uh, metabolic regulators, such as brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF. And that's a really important um, uh, signal, uh, metab you know, signaling metabolite or reg energy regulator uh, that that tells the neurons to grow and, and maintain synaptic structure. And it's just hugely important for, uh, for anything neurological. Yeah. So the ketones do a lot. If you look beyond the ketones though, the keep the diet and the fasting, what they also do is they enhance um, the energy status of our cells in general by uh, focusing the health of mitochondria, which are, uh, as most of your viewers, I'm sure now, the, the batteries in our cells, all our cells contain hundreds of thousands of these little batteries called mitochondria. Not all of them, but almost all of them. And fasting and the diet stimulate these little batteries to, uh, to divide. It's called mitochondria biogenesis. And they make them more efficient, probably. Uh, there's uh, pretty decent evidence that they make the mitochondria more efficient at producing energy and produce fewer free radicals. And they stimulate processes like autophagy, which is sort of a, a uh, cell recycling program where um, cells uh, break down junky proteins, junky mitochondria, and use that to make new ones. And it's kind of like, um, you know, uh, just recycling and, and revitalizing the cells. So fasting stimulates that to a very strong degree and ketogenic diets to a uh, lesser degree. In fact, all those processes I just mentioned, fasting stimulates it to a high degree. And I'm talking uh, multi-day fasts, like what Serona did. She fasted for seven days at a time. Uh, and the ketogenic diet stimulates it to a lesser degree. So that's some of the benefits of the ketogenic diet and fasting in, in general. And uh, they, they make your uh, cells more energy efficient. And that is applicable to a broad range of diseases from degeneration, such as Parkinson's, to cancer, such as what Serona used it for. Excellent. I feel like I just had a little 
microbiology, microchemistry 101 about ketosis, yeah, which, sorry, which is awesome. Long. Hopefully there won't be a quiz at the end of the podcast, <laughs> but that's, that's perfect. But so, so people are listening, of course, this may, you know, when you're talking about cell production energy, people think, okay, this makes sense regarding like muscles and obviously your nervous system needs lots of energy and nerves can use both carbohydrates as well as ketone bodies. But just talk to us about how this helps Serona with regard to cancer, because people are saying, all right, well, I get the Parkinson's, I get the muscles, the nerves, but how does this relate to cancer? Okay, so um, it's, it's about mitochondria health. And so whether, you know, the mitochondria are sick in Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, but they're also sick, they're damaged in cancer. And it's, uh, there was this fellow named Otto Warburg who you know, about oh, almost 100 years ago, who discovered uh, that uh, cancer cells do something different compared to normal cells. They almost universally require glucose as a fuel, so they can't use ketones or fats very well. There's really not much good evidence that they can utilize those to grow. And the way they use the glucose is in this process called the Warburg effect, which um, basically means it's a process called aerobic fermentation. So what they do, cancer cells just consume vast amounts of glucose, and they also produce lactic acid at the same time. And so they create a little acidic environment while consuming tons of glucose. And that is what allows them to continuously proliferate and grow. Now, in her case, um, you know, we have this very large tumor that had cancer cells in it. It was a stage 4A tumor, metastatic. It was not a small tumor. And so the idea was to, uh, through fasting and a ketogenic diet, surround the tumor with low glucose levels, so deprive it of its major fuel, while surrounding it at the same time with high levels of ketones that the cancer cells cannot readily use. And so you're trying to, you know, to, to use a, a overused word, starve the cancer. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that was the gist of it. At, at the same time, you are enhancing the um, mitochondria health of any normal cells that are around, so making the normal cells more resilient. And of course, the normal cells can use the ketones readily. So they have no problem with low glucose levels or high ketone levels. The normal cells um, are just fine with that. This is a, a thing that some oncologists call uh, differential stress resistance. So when you fast or do a keto diet, there's a difference in how normal cells and cancer cells can cope with the stress. It's kind of a stress when you suddenly drop glucose levels and increase ketone levels for all cells. But normal cells, they have no problem with that. They stop growing. They tend to go into a stasis or survival mode, upregulate autophagy and other things that make them more resilient in the future. So it's, it's, it's this concept of making your normal cells stronger through each successive fast. Well, the cancer cells, they can't stop growing, but that's what they do. And they can't use the ketones, so they need their glucose, and yet you've dropped your glucose levels to three or 2.5 for long periods of time. And so, you know, you basically what she did was make her body environment extremely hostile to cancer cells, but very favorable to normal cells. And it was just a rinse and repeat, rinse, recycle, repeat thing. You, you, you do a mild stress, like a, a pulse press, if you will, um, a pulse with the fast, so a really hard stress, and then a, a little press, a mild stress, the keto diet, and then another pulse with the fast, and you just keep doing that. And she did it for two years. And the result was pretty remarkable. Hmm. I like that pulse and press. Pulse and press, yeah. the, the pulse part is the- Dr. Thomas Seafried actually coined that term, press pulse. So it's not my term, it's his. <laughs> yeah. And the, the fasting part is seven days? Yeah, what her protocol was, was um, we did seven, she did seven days fast every two months for the first year and the rest keto diet. And then we increased it we went seven days every month or so. And so those seven days, is there water allowed? Is it no calories? Is it like what's the, what's the yeah, definition of fast one. for that? 
Well, the, the first year um, I would add in bone broth to maybe day three or four, mm -hmm. and really that would help with the myasthenia symptoms. Uh, and the second year it was just water mm -hmm. for the seven days. And was it the second year just felt easier and more like you could, you were kind of used to it or um, I just, your body I was more it. resilient, you think? Well, the myasthenia was more under control. Um, and I'm a bit of a purist, so I really wanted to see the tumor gone. Like that was that was always um, always my faith and hope is that it would go. And so I just felt that we needed to step it up, step it up a notch. Yeah. So cancer thrives on sugar. Cancer, okay. cancer, cra cancer craves sugar. Yes. Yeah. And basically, they're different. We're using two different evidence-based ways here or to, of course, starve the cancer. But with that, there are probably changes in inflammation and cell signaling and gene expression and all the other things that we're learning more and more about. Absolutely. And I didn't go into those things because uh, there's so much to talk about with it and, and we only have so much time. Uh, but yes, the uh, cancer thrives in an environment of uh, acidity and inflammation and there are <clears throat> it, it also likes hypoxia it, it you know it thrives in a low oxygen environment so by doing these therapies you're improving um, cell respiration through the mitochondria health they, which means they're using oxygen to make energy more and um, inflammation is dampened by both of these therapies, which uh, won't be good for tumor cells either. So yeah, there are so many levels to fasting and keto diets. And this is what their appeal is to me uh, in the first place. Medications, which I still use and I'm not anti, although we use too much, I think, they typically focus on one or two targets. And so you end up having someone on 10 or 12 different medications. I'm sure you've seen it. Joe, I see it all the time. But these, the diet and the fasting are aiming to put your body into this alternate metabolic state where thousands of pathways are altered because it, they're changing master regulators of metabolism, which are these few key enzymes and whatnot that, and hormones that affect so many other things. And it's just, it's like, it's like, you know, changing an instrument in an orchestra, that would be what a medication does versus changing the whole orchestra. Mm. And that's what the fasting and keto diets do. And that is the, the, the power, the potential power of that. I, I find that very appealing and that people can actually truly induce self healing this way yeah. uh, rather than just dabble at symptoms. We, um, we know that my, tumor grew within three years because I had an x-ray when I was 34 mm. and so it got it got like that big within three years and then when I met Matt and Matt took me through keto and fasting that was two and a half years that it didn't grow um, and the only therapy I was doing was keto and fasting. It's quite remark it's quite remarkable I mean, when you, if you really think of it because there's so much money poured into cancer which there, there should be obviously it's a can be a terminal disease for some people. And there's a lot of different types of treatments out there. Some work very well and some have side effects that are, are not pleasant, but at times necessary. But then you take something like eating two or three times a day. In, and especially the way you're doing it, which is a modified, like you mentioned before, it's not a very strict version of the ketogenic diet. You're just taking out three different types of foods and it's modified. So it's you know easy for people. You're of course giving them some support and helping them with information and access and education. But yeah. you know, when, we, when you go into PubMed and you look at the amount of human trials on ketogenic diets, there's not a whole bunch of them. And why are we not seeing more if, if there's even just one case study like this, which we're beyond one case study at this point, why are we not investigating this more and starting to encourage people with ways that are effective for them and help them. And, you know, they can nurture their bodies in, in many different types of ways. Well, the easy answer, Joe, is to say there's no money in it. Um, like it's hard to market keto diets and it's really hard to market something like fasting. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but I think there's a deeper reason, and it goes back a couple hundred years. Um, if you you know you got to look in history, I think sometimes to see why is medicine the way it is. The the reason is medicine is the way we view medicine is treating people with medications, and that's what we learned in medical school, and that's pretty much it. But medicine was not always that way. I mean, Hippocrates, you know, the father of Western medicine, was treating people with fasting techniques, uh, you know, a couple thousand years ago. So. I guess that maybe 200 years ago, there was, there was this uh, debate between um, a couple of fa fairly famous doctors, Louis Pasteur and Antoine Bichamp, and they were, I don't know if you've heard of this theory, but the Pasteur was sort of one of the biggest proponents of the germ theory of disease. So germs are out there, they're bad, we have to kill them with vaccines and whatnot. And he, he actually had an, uh, a competitor or, or a, uh, you know, a dissident uh, named Antoine Bichamp, who was uh, a, a medical doctor and scientist, and he had this thing called the host theory or, or terrain theory of disease. And he said, yes, there are um, bacteria and whatnot out there, but if you make the terrain, the body, the health of the body strong enough, then really those, uh, you know, foreign uh, agents won't be able to find purchase in the terrain and cause disease. So it's more, it was more a health-centered keeping your body strong approach. Unfortunately, Antoine Bichamp did not really get into specific details on how to do that. Like he never really talked about periodic fasting or any or ketogenic diets weren't even invented. So um, he lost the debate and Pasteur's view came to dominate medicine and it still dominates medicine. We attack cancer, for example, with chemo and radio. We attack it, we, we try to uh, wipe it out. It's a foreign thing. But if you think about it, it's just our own cells misbehaving. So why are we trying to attack it? Why are we not trying to um, adopt a more Bichamp approach, make the terrain unsuitable for cancer? And that way, you know, it just, uh, the idea is theoretically that the malignant cells just won't, will die because they can't change. And, you know, cells won't want to become cancers because the environment's changed. So, why are we not seeing more research? Because uh, the preponderance of Pasteur uh, germ theory and this kind of way that we view medicine, it's, it's, it's riddled throughout medicine. It's really hard to see outside of it that there are other ways that medicine can be conceptualized. And I, I firmly believe that eventually we'll get to the point where we can do a lot more against these seemingly incurable disorders like you know, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and stage four cancer by adopting a different uh, viewpoint more in line with Bichamp's original theory. Yeah. I like what you're saying about you know, the, the idea of fighting cancer, which um, sounds good in a way, but I, often, I oftentimes wonder for people who are not successfully fighting cancer through traditional methods, what's that message really sending them that they're not strong then they're not fighting hard enough versus exactly. What you're doing is helping people create a, you know, a healthy environment in their body where they can nurture themselves and heal, heal themselves. And mm -hmm. if they still, if they have to be on, um, you know, mm -hmm. traditional methods, this can still be part of their their treatment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, that's right. I mean, I'm not uh, against. I'll, I'll use whatever works. <laughs> I'm not against anything. Some things have more evidence than others. I'm, I am evidence-based, and so I do like to see good research supporting the therapy. But, um, and in Serona's case, I mean, the result was outstanding, but she's one person. So we have to really think hard before we draw causal connections to, to, uh, with, with too much um, you know, determination. But uh, you know, be, because of her study, though, uh, we're actually We've got um, six, um, probably seven people with glio stage four glioblastoma starting her protocol, Serona's protocol, this year. And uh, probably we're going to get a few more people. We'll, we're still taking people in. And all we're doing with those people is uh, the same as Serona did. Uh, they're actually doing a five to seven day fast every month with a keto diet in between. And so it's early days. And, you know, let's just see what happens. They're still getting their chemo, radio, standard of care therapy. and you know, the oncologists are aware of what's happening, so that's good. 
Um, but let's just see. Let's see what happens when we combine a Pasteur approach with a Bichamp approach. Maybe we can have a better outcome for a very, uh, you know, terrible cancer like like hers what was. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm interested in hearing about the research. So please come back. Um, oh, well. and let us know yeah. about everything. You guys are like the dynamic duo. So um, you guys <laughs> yeah. should take this on the road. I think it's really good. You have the, you know, the science and of course the more practical part coming from Smyrna. So I, I wish you both luck. And um, Dr. Phillips, let us know how we can learn more about you and how people can follow your work. Yeah, I can. I can send you my. Uh, I got. I'm on Research Gate, uh, and uh, I'm going to have a LinkedIn account up very soon. <laughs> I'm really not very good at social media, so I'm not on Twitter or anything. I probably should change that at some point. Yeah, at this point, not. So, yeah, and I'm happy to answer anyone who emails me. My email is always on any papers that I've published. Yeah, and of course, we'll have all those links on the podcast page. I want to thank. Um, Dr. Phillips and Serona for being here today. Um, thanks for sharing your story, Serona, and thanks for sharing all the research and the great work you're doing, Dr. Phillips. Make sure to share this episode with your friends and family who are interested in a ketogenic diet and how it has an impact on cancer, Parkinson's disease, and chronic pain. I'm Dr. Joe Tata, and we'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Healing Pain Podcast with Dr. Joe Tata. To subscribe to the podcast and learn more, visit integrativepainscienceinstitute.com. That's integrativepainscienceinstitute.com. Sign up to receive weekly updates, leave a review on iTunes, and share this episode with your friends.